Hello, everybody. We're going to start the session. So could you please take your seats? We are 20 minutes late. So we have a big challenge ahead of us to keep to the time. Um, I will be asking the speakers to really do their best to keep to the time. And I hope that we will have at the end of the session sometimes for, for questions and answers as a reward. So let me introduce myself briefly. I am uh, Ima Placencia. I am a senior expert in the European Commission on uh, Disability and Inclusion. And I am going to be your moderator for this uh, session. This is really a very interesting session because this conference, which is about accessibility, is going to be, is requiring a definition of what accessibility is about. And that's what we are going to discuss today when we talk about standards, manuals, toolboxes, guidance. We need to have to spell out what accessibility is in order to have a step towards implementation. I think that um, it is very important to um, use those resources which are available worldwide. In this area of disability policies, accessibility, resources are very scarce. And I think it's important to move forward and avoid reinventing the wheel and make use of those resources which are available. A couple of years ago, to give you an example, we did a study trying to set the basis for an accessibility standard for the built environment. We found out that only in Europe there were over 300 different standards, guidelines, toolboxes, um, legislations that contain technical requirements, and most of them were saying the same, just in a different, slightly way. The holes, the, the, the gaps in particular areas, for example, persons with intellectual disabilities, what, uh, what do they need in the built environment, was in all of them. So why don't we build, resor why don't we build on those resources and concentrate our efforts, efforts to close those gaps? I hope that in the session that we will have today, we will have an opportunity to share with you those standards, those manuals, toolboxes that will help to advance, to advance in the field. I don't want to take more time, so it's my um, pleasure to hand over the floor to the first uh, speaker. It's an honor for me to have my uh, colleague and director of the commission, it's another uh, DG, DG um, uh, Information uh, Connect, DG Connect, sorry. Uh, I used to work when it was called Information Society, so sorry for that. Communications Network Content and Technologies, I get carried out uh, with this. Um, Gail uh, Kent is going to tell us what uh, is happening in DigiConnect. Uh, you can see the CVs, by the way, of all the speakers in this booklet. So all I'm going to tell you about Kent is that she has a very, very heavy responsibility, a very important one, with all the research on um, accessible ICT and assistive technologies, which is very relevant for today, but also a directive, a very important piece of legislation on web accessibility. So, Gail, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, it's a great honor to be here today to present the Web Accessibility Directive of the European Union as one of the innovative policies. Um, as we'll be getting uh, an award later, I would just also like to thank now the Zero Project and the ESSEL Foundation for the recognition on behalf of all the institutions involved in this directive. So, see if I can go, yes. It was a long trip for the European Commission proposal from 2012 
in which our colleague and the chair of this session, Ima, was also involved to getting it adopted in 2016. It needed the dedication and commitment of the European Parliament and of the Council of the European Union, for which I would like to give my special thanks as well. The directive entered into force in December 2016, opening the way to <coughs> ensure that uniformly in the member states of the European Union, all websites of the public sector will be accessible by September 2020 and all mobile applications of the public sector by June 2021. The providers of information and services rely increasingly on the internet. They provide a wide range of information and services online which are important to the public. And the public means everybody. My DG is responsible for the digital single market and we don't want part of the digital single market um, being blocked to um, citizens and they're not able to participate in it. So it should also include the more than 80 million EU citizens with disabilities. The directive sets out to increase digital inclusion by making public sector websites and mobile applications accessible, thereby facilitating independence and integration of people with disabilities and the elderly in social and cultural life. But the objective of the directive is twofold. It also aims to reduce the fragmentation in the digital accessibility market. It does so by harmonizing standards, not only for websites, but also for mobile apps that can be used also beyond the public sector, and by promoting the sharing of best practices to help providers of accessibility related products and services. What's the mechanism behind these objectives? Harmonizing the requirements in the whole of the EU will reduce uncertainty for developers and would foster interoperability. Common accessibility requirements would reduce barriers in the digital accessibility market and would open it up. Harmonizing requirements not only for websites, but also for the increasingly important mobile application expands these effects. The better conditions and outlook will boost the accessibility market, leading to more competition and making accessibility solutions more affordable. And finally, it's a virtuous circle because more affordable solutions will lead to more accessibility. So when will this all happen? The EU member states have the obligation in their national law um, to set it in their national law by September this year and should start to apply those rules by September 2019. By the end of 2020, the rules should also apply to all public web sector websites and by mid-2021 also to all public sector mobile apps. After that, there is a strong hope that if accessible public sector websites and mobile apps become the default offer for development, as well as a regular award criterion from procurers, a spillover to developers and private sector contractors would happen. The minimum level of accessibility aimed at is based on the existing European standard. So I'm not going to read out all those figures, but for those techies amongst you, um, you can see it on the screen. The EN standard is also at the heart of the cooperation to harmonize IC stand ICT standards across the Atlantic, which is the subject of another innovative policy recognized by the Zero Project. The directive foresees further technical specifications regarding mobile applications and a so-called harmonized standard that would encompass the requirements for both websites and mobile apps. This work is coordinated, by the way, with the development of the WCAG 2.1 guidelines. That sums up the basis for harmonization. 
As for the application of the rules, it has to be recognized that for some mainly very small public sector bodies, it would be overly burdensome to provide accessibility from day one. The directive therefore provides the possibility to claim undue burden. These claims, and in general the application of the requirements, should then be overseen in the enforcement mechanisms set up by each member state. The directive also has other features built in, aiming to improve accessibility and to raise awareness. Periodical monitoring of the compliance done by member states will provide data on the common accessibility barriers and feedback to the public sector bodies on the status of their websites and mobile apps. An accessibility statement to be presented on the relevant sites will inform end users on the level of accessibility and also encourage public sector bodies to assess their accessibility. Furthermore, as fine-tuning, a so-called feedback mechanism has to be established in each member state to make possible the reporting of accessibility failures and requesting information excluded from the directive's application. It's also necessary to mention that the directive explicitly underlines the need for training and awareness raising as well as the importance of maintaining cooperation between the member states and the stakeholders in order to ensure an efficient transition to accessibility. So what are the next steps, the immediate next steps? Member states have to transpose the obligations set by their directive in their national law by this September and to further ensure uniform conditions by the end of this year, the European Commission will have to adopt implementing acts regarding the accessibility requirements for mobile apps, the accessibility statement, monitoring and reporting. We are convinced that this policy with all its safeguards will result in improved conditions in the digital accessibility market, more competition and a better provision of accessibility solutions and in the end, in more accessible websites and mobile applications. We invite all the participants of the conference to take part and to take advantages of this opportunity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gail. I think it's been really um, an excellent overview of um, what the Commission has been uh, doing in order to make public sector websites accessible and how we have used resources that were there in terms of standards, worldwide uh, level standards, aligning we also with, with uh, um, US work on um, Section 508, uh, uh, legislation and now also I'm really very happy because uh, uh, the work done on the web accessibility directive on the technical requirements will be used in the Accessibility Act in order to ensure that harmonization. I think that in the world of accessibility harmonization is really uh, a, key, a key word. Now let me pass now from the ICT world into the world of the built environment where we really have the privilege of having with us Erika Plevnik um, which really is going to share her extensive expertise um, as a consultant on accessibility and focusing on the built environment. Thank you very much uh, Erika, the floor is yours. Thank you and uh, Good afternoon. Is it already afternoon or good morning <laughs> to the audience? Um, first, I want to thank the Essel Foundation for this very important uh, initiative and I also want to thank for the opportunity to present uh, our project barrierecheck.at. Uh, uh, let me give you a few words to our association. Uh, we are uh, a federal association in Austria uh, and uh, we support independent and inclusive living for people with disabilities. Together with the Austrian Chamber of Commerce, 
Uh, we developed in 2015 an online tool which is called uh, Barriere Check. Uh, you can find it on the website www.barriers-check.at. <laughs> um, uh, this tool allows businesses to learn about accessibility and to analyze uh, their own situation and its premises regarding uh, accessibility. Since 2015, uh, there were more than 11,000 users on the website who hit the web pages over 90,000 uh, times. Uh, for many companies in Austria, the legislation uh, regarding obligatory uh, accessibility uh, has been unfamiliar and sometimes even met with uh, resistance. Therefore, we wanted to support uh, with a low threshold service. Uh, we wanted to do awareness raising um, in the businesses and we wanted to transfer knowledge with our tool. Barrier check gives a detailed analysis of uh, the service chain of businesses, and this uh, service chain consists of different modules, which can be chosen, integrated, and removed uh, via drag and drop features. Uh, and here we prepared uh, a screenshot uh, how it starts. How, um, businesses uh, can do the check. Uh, we have uh, about eight branches, which include about uh, 30 sub-branches. Uh, for example, uh, tourism, trading, bank business, consulting, transport, and events. And at the beginning, the user can choose uh, uh, his branch. And then the online tool suggests a standard service chain uh, of the branch, uh, which looks like uh, this screenshot, which you can see now. So it uh, exists of different elements. This service, uh, the service chain exists, um, has different elements. For example, this uh, screenshot shows a service chain of a food retailer. Uh, at the beginning, uh, we start with uh, information on the website, then an accessibility, an accessible parking lot, accessible entrance, uh, also the question if the staff is trained um, and an accessible ca cash desk. Uh, the user then clicks the check button and answers the questions about the accessibility of each element, um, which may look like this. This is an example, also an, a, a screenshot. This is an example for a checklist uh, for parking lots, how parking lots uh, should look like. <clears throat> The online uh, check was uh, was also designed as a survey with uh, as a survey with check boxes, and uh, in this example, uh, the survey requires all information about the parking lots. Um, and at the end, uh, when all uh, survey uh, uh, questions has been answered, the user gets and all over information of the service chain, uh, which is the result. And uh, this list is a structured list of all data, of all data uh, that were gathered. And in, this list includes information, yes, of all the elements of the service chain. Uh, and we also try to encourage the, com uh, the companies to present the results on their own website, which maybe uh, might be used as kind of accessibility uh, statement. 
And even some companies do that. They have posted or uh, this uh, accessibility um, um, list uh, on their website. Uh, we've got uh, many positive uh, feedback from the users. Here, uh, some of them, um, even even a teacher at school uh, gave us feedback on the tool. They use it to explain the pupils what accessibility in the built environment actually means. Um, yes, we also got feedback that is easy to use, which we want it to be, uh, and that it is useful. Yes, that's all of my presentation. Um, if any questions uh, uh, raise, please, I'm here. You can ask and contact me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. This type of resources that help us to check the accessibility is really uh, useful in order to get feedback on the actions that, that, we are, that we are implementing. Going to implementation, the next, sorry, the next speaker is uh, Raul uh, Montiel. Um, he has an extensive experience in implementing accessibility and making use of those uh, uh, standards, manuals, and toolboxes. And he's going to share that experience with, uh, with all of us. Raul, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and thank you to Cero Project for invi inviting us to be here. We are a Paraguayan foundation with 21 years of work in the field of the rights of people with disabilities. We, the founders, are parents, brothers, and sisters of persons with intellectual disabilities, but now we are working for all the persons with disabilities. Physical and attitudinal accessibility in Paraguay were extremely limited in private and public sectors. So with our support, the government of Paraguay started to create new laws and policies to change this reality. We have a holistic approach to accessibility, from physical to attitudinal and legal barriers. We go for eliminating them. We don't do it alone. We start every action creating a win-win relationship with all relevant stakeholders existing that could be affected by our intervention. That allow us to enter with no opposition. We network with civil society, with private companies, with central and local governments, and of course with the press. The press is a key ally always for us. We even have a network of inclusive journalists with over 100 journalists that are our friends, that they understand what, uh, what are we doing, and they are supporting us every day in the field and in my country, the press is a very powerful actor that makes things to change. Jay, sir, can we put it with the music?
Así se denomina la campaña de la Fundación Saraquí, que busca llamar la atención a las autoridades. En las calles azulcenas amanecieron este lunes con la denuncia de obras que no existen. Estas rampas para los discapacitados. para solidarizarse con la campaña de la Fundación Saraquí. An example of a very cheap campaign. This is an example of a very cheap campaign. It costs us less than ten thousand dollars, and it really make many changes because of the public starting to collaborate. Then the companies and then the authorities realize the importance of the ramps, and after that, many regulations were adjusted and. Uh, the government started to build ramps. Another example of a campaign to support the Tribunal High Court to make accessible the municipal elections of 2015. Y por eso las excusas no están en tu vocabulario. Debe. Debe ya cango el taiba. O pava beisha. De ya porupi. Me conazó y de. A vos te pedimos que nos ayudes a elegir mejor. Una discapacidad no te quita el derecho a votar. Sumate al voto accesible. Vota. That campaign uh, was very important because. We were telling people that they, people with disability, that they had the right to vote. Uh, many people really didn't realize that. Even we have a case of uh, the sister of one of our 45 senators, national senators. She is a woman with intellectual disability, and she voted for the first time in uh, 44 years old. And being sister of, of a senator, she didn't know she has the right to vote. So that's something that we, we achieved with uh, support of USA. <laughs> now we are also working for the general elections of 2018, changing the regulations for the voting system. Basically, we don't, want, we don't wait for someone else like the government to create changes. We see things better in, in other countries, and we take the ideas back home, and we just make it happen. We work in, we network a lot. We are uh, small organizations. We have only 25 people working, but we are leading many changes, and we are very grateful with our, our support, network supporting us, and agencies, and the press, and because what, when you ask them to do something correct, like identifying and, and eliminating barriers, they just do it. But sometimes they don't do it because no one is pushing them to, to make the changes. We are heading now to the inclusive education in Paraguay. We are supporting with USA to the Ministry of Education to create a guideline to make inclusion happen because we have a law. One of the seven laws that we created was the inclusive education law, but from 2013 that law is, is there, but inclusion is not happening because no one knows how to make inclusion happen, especially in a poor country where uh, support systems are simply not there. And we are doing that in another, another issue. We are working in the creating of the indicators of our 
2015-2030 Action Plan for Disability, which is a main accomplishment from the civil society. Thank you very much. Thanks, Raul. That was really an, an inspiring uh, campaign, cheap and easy. And sharing these types of ideas is also really helping all of us to get, uh, to get uh, actions for, for, for the future. Now we're going to pass the floor to Amanda Basi, which is uh, working on the Rick Hansen Foundation and um, um, is going to tell us about some uh, measurements of accessibility and uh, sharing with us the practices and ideas that they are doing at the Foundation on Accessibility, which has been working, uh, the Foundation has been working in this area for a very, very long time, uh, setting also very interesting conference. I had the pleasure to be there a couple of years ago, and Canada is now really going from a transformation, developing their uh, first accessibility legislation. So really, i looking forward to hear what you have to share with us. Thank you. It's an honor to be here at the Zero Project Conference, hear all the fabulous work and ideas that have been done by the community around the world, and also share a little bit about what we at the Rick Hansen Foundation in Canada are doing. The Rick Hansen Foundation was established about 30 years ago um, with Rick Hansen, who is now a well-known Canadian, a Paralympian, who in his early 20s decided one day to raise awareness and raise funds for spinal cord injury research by taking to his wheelchair and going around the world. It took two years, two months, two days. The dream was, and still is, to create a world that's accessible and inclusive for all. So with lots of transformational change in raising awareness and removing barriers, a few years ago the foundation conducted a strategic review and really saw to fill a gap that it saw in terms of creating inclusion in places where we live, work and play. And ultimately that's based on a lot of the universal design principles that those of you that were here for the last session had really fantastic examples of. So the foundation has created an accessibility certification program. It's a LEED style rating system. Um, by LEED, that's the environmental design um, behind green buildings that have become very successful. And it measures, rates, and certifies the meaningful access in the built environment. To do this, we've developed a universally applicable rating survey or a questionnaire where trained assessors complete. It ultimately looks at a function of a space and considers the holistic user experience. Uh, we focused on three main disability groups, uh, mobility, hearing, and vision. And really behind the certification program is understanding that accessibility is not simply meeting a checklist, it's not meeting building code, it's not the sum of the parts. But instead, it's looking at the holistic user experience, focusing on universal design principles, and creating inclusion. So the Madam Chairwoman mentioned uh, Canada and accessibility legislation. In Canada, it's definitely a changing world. There's legislation. It's the first time we've had a minister and ministry dedicated to people with disabilities on the federal level. It's also the demographics call for a need for thinking about the areas that we all access. In Canada, one in seven adults have a disability. This is projected to increase to one in five in 2036. So in less than 20 years, 20% 20 of the population will be a people with disability. Behind this is our aging population. The certification program has been led with one of um, Canada's leading experts in barrier-free and universal design, Brad McCannell. He's a 60-year-ish old man. He uses a wheelchair. He's a quadriplegic. And he talks about his mom. She's 80-something, fiercely independent, has trouble getting around, but refuses to use a mobility aid. 
can't really see all that well, and as Brad would like to say, can't hear worth a damn. And then he goes on to say, my mom feels sorry for me because I use a wheelchair. But it's about talking about our moms, our aging moms. If we're helping create meaningful access in the built environment using universal design, it's benefiting everybody, not just people with disabilities, it's our moms, it's parents with strollers, it's those suffering from temporary illness. It's a benefit for everybody. And that is what we see in Canada more and more. So in terms of our certification program, what do we rate, what do we certify? Um, the built environment, so that's buildings. We look at institutional spaces or public realm spaces, so it could be anything from city halls to schools to hospitals to rec centres. Um, commercial spaces, retail spaces, malls, offices. Um, we we'll also look at residential buildings, focusing more on multi-unit um, right now um, due to um, impact. We also look at trails and pathways, and um, there was great examples um, by our Norwegian friends in the last session about the importance of trail, pathways, and access those create. We also look at not just existing infrastructure, but those at the design and construction phase by looking at the, the construction drawings and awarding provisional certification. And the certification program, one of the outcomes is really to put the thinking of barrier-free design, universal design, back into the hands of designers. Why create a building or an entrance with steps and the other half with ramps? Why have a step there in the first place? When we look at what will be rated, um, assessors have a look at various aspects of the building, which is listed on the, on the screen behind me. Um, and these various categories form the questionnaire or the rating survey. Um, it's formed on lots of research around the world. Um, Canadian Standards Association has uh, B651 standards, which used to inform this also, um, which is also the basis of Canadian National Building Code. The completion of the, of the survey really determines what the certification levels are. There's two. Um, if a building scores 80% or higher on the survey, it gets a certified gold designation. Between 60 and 79%, it receives a certified designation. Anything below 60% is not certified. Before I go on to the sustainability, um, the funding and the capacity and the business model, um, I'd just like to talk a little bit about how it works. Um, to, to allow scalability and the pieces that we've been working on. So we've partnered with the Canadian Standards Association to create a registry. It's an online platform that does several things. It's way participants get their results or their scorecard. It also con controls who can conduct the ratings, so who's qualified to do so. Um, it's a platform where trained accessibility assessors enter in their rating survey, and they also enter evidence, so photos or comments. And these eventually form the main check and balance of the program, which is goes to an adjudicator. Um, the adjudicator reviews the survey, the evidence, the story that's been told by the assessor, and approves, or they could push back for further clarification or questions. Once it's approved and the participant, the end user, gets their result, it's also the tool that the end user can ultimately use to showcase their commitment to accessibility if, if they choose to. And that's a really important part in terms of certification and just the general nervousness about being accessibility. I get this all the time is, what if I do badly? Or I care about accessibility, I want to do something. There's a lot of information out there. I'm not sure, I don't want to try, because if I try and I do it quite right, I'm going to get backlash. So we keep this component of confidentiality and the ability to share results at the discretion of the participant. Um, I just noticed time, so very quickly in terms of the model is that we have an application feed for participants. Um, that goes to the foundation and covers the cost of the registry and adjudication. Um, rating is something set by the assessors and there's also public recognition tools. 
Um, a key part of this is our trained assessors, and I'll touch upon this briefly, is that we've developed a course in universal design and applying our rating survey, a professional competency exam, field experience requirements um, that anybody can take. Um, there's particular emphasis on the professional community, the design construction community, um, as another tool in their toolbox. We are in a pilot phase. We've conducted our second phase. Um, and we also have um, plans to rate a certain amount of buildings in BC, as well as train um, a certain amount of assessors in Canada and, um, and conduct ratings over the next short to midterm goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. I think that um, this uh, toolkit contains really uh, a lot of knowledge and experience that you have been gathering throughout the years and uh, uh, the combination of checking for accessibility but at the same time training and having remedial actions is really something that we can, we can all take, uh, take back uh, home for our own uh, buildings and, uh, and uh, cities. Uh, let me tell you that um, in the places where we work, in the places where we live, there is a lot of improvement also to be, to be done. So um, this is, uh, we have been concentrating for the, to the built environment, accessibility in the built environment, started with ICT and now we're going back to ICT. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Klaus Hockner, which is um, a member of the Austrian Disability Forum. Uh, he is here also representing the, the, the user's perspective, but he's an, an, an trained um, engineer. He has a very technical background, and he's going to share with us how um, he is looking to this issue of standards, manuals, toolboxes um, uh, to improve accessibility. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ima. Uh, the services for the blind is not is not really uh, the right session that we are in. Uh, I just switched me from from the other one. I'm uh, wearing several hats here uh, in front of, of the audience. Uh, I'm the CEO of a blind organization here in Austria, one of the biggest ones, uh, and also the vice president of the Austrian Computer Society, who is the bureau of this web accessibility certificate. Uh, what's, uh, what's the initial situation? The initial situation was uh, in Austria, uh, or not only in Austria, I'm always asked by companies, why don't we have a certificate that proves <clears throat> that we are accessible according to the rules of the laws that we have in Austria, for example. We have a law in Austria uh, which uh, refers to WCAG 2.0 AA, for example, and which uh, obliges all companies that are offering services uh, and goods to the consumers, uh, for example, to be accessible since 2006 now. But uh, I do think uh, we do only have about 10 to 20, at the max, 30% of all websites that are accessible in the way uh, of WCAG 2.0 AA compliant. <clears throat> the initial situation was that uh, we looked on other countries uh, what they are doing uh, in certification. Uh, there are some certifications uh, or certification schedules in different other countries, uh, but uh, only corporate campus companies offer certificates based on different approaches. For example, in Germany, the BITV, uh, which is a little bit a kind of uh, WCAG 2.0 AA. Uh, and in Switzerland, we have the Access for All Foundation that offers certification, but uh, all these certifications are offered by <clears throat> not by independent organizations. Uh, due to these different approaches and standards, it's difficult to compare the results, and that's uh, we are, why we are coming back to the first, um, uh, to the first uh, presentation that we had about <clears throat> the Web Accessibility Directive, the Web Accessi Accessibility Directive also uh, has the obligation from 2020, I do think, on uh, to make a sample and to make it comparable uh, between the different countries and to report from the countryside to the commission uh, about accessibility. Uh, so there are 
till now there are no options for reporting uh, uh, for the reporting and for the comparison of the of different websites and that was one of our main goals uh, to uh, enhance the user experience first of all yeah that's, that's one of the main goals that we have here yeah? uh, and to achieve legal security for the owners of the website uh, that they can say okay <clears throat> if they are sued for example in in Austria we are compliant to WCAG 2.0 or we are compliant to the rules that are uh, in force in Austria. The benefits from these projects will be the creation of a transparent and trustworthy organization behind the certificate, aggregating data that is comparable and can be used for public monitoring authorities, for example, for the reports to the European Commission. Due to the international cooperation, more countries should adopt uh, that content, concept to create a uniform standard for the whole world. That would be the goal, the overall goal <laughs> but um, the sky is the limit, you see. <laughs> there, are, there are two certificate levels that we have. Uh, the first one is the candidate. The candidate uh, of the candidate of, of, of certification of, of web accessibility certification uh, has to has to fulfill <clears throat> a certain uh, level of. Uh, Web accessibility compliance uh, to the WCAG 2.0 uh, AA criteria, and he, has, he or she or it has enough time uh, to fulfill the procedure to make uh, the website uh, compliant to the uh, to the rules that uh, we offer, that we that we uh, want them to 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 fulfill. Yeah, uh, the certificate if you. If you fulfill uh, the certification uh, process, then you will get a snippet, a Java-based, uh, JavaScript-based snippet for the website, and the evaluation report is published in a database for public interest. Everybody can look into this report and can say, can see how uh, the certification is, has been achieved. Uh, it's not a secret. It's not only and it's a web uh, it's a java based uh, javascript based snippet so it's not only uh, a png or a jpeg or a gif or something like that uh, that's, that's put on the website uh, and there is a possibility for the user to report problems the certificate is valid for two years and needs to be re-evaluated uh, also, there is a need for re-evaluation uh, if there are significant changes in the website structure or in the functionality. For example, if the <coughs> content management system is changed for, uh, uh, in, in, in this case, it would be, it would be necessary for, to, to come for a re-evaluation. The concept uh, or the methodology uh, of the uh, evaluation was done by a group of specialists from different disciplines uh, so we brought all stakeholders together on one table here in Austria. Uh, the evaluation is based on the WCAG 2.0 AA criteria and the process of the WCAG evaluation method 1.0. And the committee also provides decision recommendations for special cases, cases to guarantee the uniformity uh, of the handling of the uh, evaluations. What is the authority? I think that's one of the crucial points that we have, uh, that not a company which is based on uh, economic interest is the Bureau of the, uh, of the Certification. The Certification Authority is the OCG, the Austrian Computer Society. The OCG is a non-profit organization known for the European Computer Driving License uh, in, here in Austria. Uh, it's an umbrella organization of uh, organizations and companies working in the field of ICT with more than 1,000 members. Uh, and the, OCG, uh, the Austrian Computer Society uh, is uh, 
the bureau of this um, uh, of this certificate. It has a huge, huge network of companies, NGOs, educational and science institutions, and governmental organizations behind uh, behind her, behind it. Uh, that has no commercial interests. The, audition, the audition auditors uh, for the uh, certification are nominated by the Austrian Computer Society and selected randomly to eliminate close relationships to the applicants. We have also an independent advisory council um, <clears throat> that has set up this uh, certification that is responsible for the conception, implementation, and monitoring of the methodology, as well as for strategic issues. issues. It consists of the methodology group and the general board of uh, the uh, certification uh, process. Yeah? The board also nominates auditors after the application. They have to provide essential knowledge and experience in the topic of accessibility, of the web accessibility in general. The advisory council consists of people from different organizations, such as, such as agencies, universities, NGOs, and governmental organizations, to provide a maximum knowledge for decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is really a tool and a process that uh, will be very useful uh, for all of us working on uh, web, uh, web um, accessibility. And you managed to keep in the time even without the tool, uh, yes. the timekeeping tool. So um, now we go to the, to the last speaker, which is uh, for this session, Tracy Chipman. She is um, a program director from uh, Gates. Um, which is an alliance um, working on accessibility. And she's going to, to share with us how um, they operate and um, address uh, using also um, the certificates uh, for accessibility. Tracy, thank right. you. Thank you so much. Before I get into the main topic of our international certification of accessibility consultants in the built environment, I do want to just introduce our company to those who, who don't know of Gates. Uh, Gates is a Canadian nonprofit organization that was founded in 2007 by an international consortium of accessibility practitioners who established a mission to lead in the promotion, understanding, and implementation of accessibility of the built. Uh, social and virtual env environments. Gates seeks to support the effective implementation of the UNCRPD through the provision of technical advisory services, project consultation, and training. We view ourselves as a consortium of, of expert accessibility consultants providing an international voice on practical solutions to disability needs. So before I get into go to the main topic, I just want to provide an overview of a couple of examples of our other programs, um, as well as touch on the Canadian and ISO standards that guide our work. So Gates' management team coordinates a country representative program of consultants who work collaboratively, collaboratively with Gates to promote the implementation and monitoring of the UN Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities and Universal Design. Gates's country reps are volunteers who are committed and critically important to assist in the achievement of Gates's mission and goals. There are several Gates's projects which have been successfully completed over the past 10 years that would not have been a success if they were not without their professional involvement. Uh, we support our country reps in their endeavors to promotion of their efforts and achievements on our global news service, Global Accessibility News, otherwise known as GAN. Through networking amongst peers, and in October of this past year, we issued a toolkit which aids in ensuring consistent messaging and delivery of services when representing Gates. And we are uh, currently seeking uh, country representatives in the areas of Central and South America, Thailand, Japan, and Europe. So if you or someone you know is interested in representing their country in this important work, we encourage individuals to access our website to read about the program or to contact myself or colleagues to discuss further. So one other program that I want to highlight is an uh, online um, course that is, uh, sorry, 
Uh, it illustrates the way that we use standards, manuals, and toolkits is the design of public spaces uh, in this online educational course. Gates, through the Government of Ontario's Enabling Change Funding Program, developed the Illustrated Technical Divide Guide to the Accessibility Standard for the Design of Public Spaces. This manual is the basis of the online course developed through the same funding program that trains professionals on the requirements of accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. So the, uh, on completion of the course, participants will understand the scope, application criteria and technical requirements of AODA, as well as their professional obligation to comply with this regulation. The manual provides valuable information regardless of your location and is available as a downloaded resource on our website. While the course provides six hours of approved development credits for practitioners in Ontario, it is open to anyone interested in furthering their understanding of the practical implementation of accessible public spaces. So given that uh, Gates is a Canadian based nonprofit, I just want to touch briefly on Canadian federal and provincial standards. I feel, Amanda, that maybe we should have coordinated our discussion a little bit. But uh, as per details on the slide, the provinces of Ontario, Quebec, and Manitoba do have specific uh, d provincial disability rights legislation in place that directs work in the built environment. Where provincial legislation is not in place, uh, provinces are guided by the Canadian Charter of he Rights and, and Freedoms. And Canada, as mentioned by our chairperson, is in the process of establishing a Federal Disabilities Act. So they've just completed their consultation phase and more details I'm sure will be soon forthcoming. So in addition to disabilities rights legislation, Canadian building codes and standards also address accessibility in the built environment. Um, the National Building Code applies to federal facilities, federal re regulated agencies such as banks, postal facilities and transportation facilities and objective based. This means that every technical requirement in the building code is achieved, must achieve at least one of the stated objectives of health, safety, accessibility, fire and structural protection and environment. So four provinces in Canada have developed their own provincial building codes. Um, and in addition, to the, in addition to these, the Canadian Standards Association has also developed the, the CAN CSA B651 Accessibility of the Built Environment Standard, which also applies to federal facilities federal re and federal re regulated agencies. Um, Canada is leading in a lot of its work, but all of these various standards do sometimes lead to a lack of harmonization of accessibility criteria across the country. <clears throat> so this slide specifically highlights uh, uh, specific ISO standards that impacts Gates' work on an international level where regional legislation or building codes do not address accessibility or in some cases simply does not exist. The point of this slide is, is to highlight the development of ISO standard 221542 uh, and noting that it involved industry leaders from over 25 countries and countries that could not attend were encouraged to send their comments for ISO consideration which created a very inclusive project or sorry inclusive uh, process. So all of those um, legislations and codes Gates uses regularly in, as we carry out our project work. Um, and I just wanted to touch on those, recognizing that we are an international organization based in Canada. And now to our latest program, which is the International Certification of Accessibility Consultants in the Built Environment. Um, several countries are moving towards mandatory certification for consultants working in accessibility. There is a global need to identify and classify through certification the wide range of knowledge and expertise amongst people who work in the field of universal design and accessibility consultant, consulting in the built environment. International and national accessibility codes and standards as well as disability rights legislation including the CRPD are complex. It is imperative that designers, architects, engineers, and clients are able to identify professionals in this field with appropriate level of knowledge and skill for their projects. 
A la the lack of an international certification program has allowed people with little or no training or expertise to present themselves as, as accessibility experts. This has led to uneven code application and sometimes inadequate or inappropriate design solutions. The identified need for validation of those working in the field of accessibility was recognized by Gates, who has filled this important gap. Significant time and with contributions from recognized global leaders, uh, this has re resulted in the first ever international level certification program for built environment accessibility practitioners with evaluation based on both regional practices, international ISO standards, and universal design. <clears throat> so reviews are conducted on a quarterly first come first serve basis as per the capacity of the expert panel. Members of the expert panel have international experience in private, public, and social sectors and, and represent a wa worldwide vision of what constitutes a universally designed and accessible built environment. Program evaluation and methodology also follows ISO standard 1704 or 024, which is the general requirement for bodies operating certification of persons. The benefits of this program include the inclusion of, um, of certified members into an online searchable registry, a resource for clients, organizations, and design professionals seeking um, accessibility and uh, professional accessibility and universal design advice, evaluation and assessment by an internationally recognized es experts in universal design, and accessibility of built environment using a professionally established and hopefully by the end of 2018, an ISO accredited process. Membership in a community of networking body of accessibility uh, consulting specialists and recognition, and perhaps the most important part, the recognition and credibility in the field of accessibility. So this slide just provides some of the feedback that we've gotten within through our pilot that we ran last fall, as well as the um, first round of uh, applicants that we're uh, currently uh, interviewing and assessing. <clears throat> so a final few points on our latest program. Um, the contact information, should you wish to apply or contact for more details, is on the screen, either through our website or the email address is there, certification at gates.org. Um, and one final point, we are um, uh, if you're interested in taking part in the program and becoming a member of our expert panel, we'll be pleased to accept CVs and discuss this opportunity with you further. And as a perhaps final, final note, we, there is still a space in our, a uh, few spots available in the reviews that are taking place in early April. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy. Uh, you have shared with us uh, also some additional resources that uh, compl complete uh, the excellent uh, contributions of all the members of the, of the panels in terms of providing guidance on what is accessibility, legislation, training of professionals, and uh, using those resources and those experts to check the, 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 the compliance. So we are I think over the, 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 the time of our session, but I would like to, to give the chance to see if there are um, burning questions. The next session we will start only at one, and as it has been decided that you jump from one to another, um, I want to take that time. Okay, so the gentleman in the second row, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is James Niamzala. I'm a researcher on issues of accessibility and inclusion. I have two questions, and uh, the first question goes to Kuz. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, throughout my research, I have found out that there is a confusion in terms of some laws where they uh, put uh, technical uh, requirements and technical details together, and confusions of as well at least to standard menus. So the a confusion between standard menus and what details the standard menus should have and what details the law should have. Can you uh, clarify what should constitute accessibility 
uh, laws and what should constitute standard menus as regards to technical requirements and uh, technical details. Second, okay, my, my second question is um, to Canada. Uh, Canada is, is pursuing, in, in terms of Ontario, is pursuing uh, integrated accessibility standards as opposed to uh, uh, accessibility standards for consumer goods and uh, services. So what are some of the advantages why Canada is pursuing integrated accessibility standards rather than fragmented standards that it, used, uh, it, it started with? So what are some, uh, are you getting the question? But initially Canada was approaching different standards and but then it shifted into bringing these standards into what we call integrated accessibility standards. Uh, so what are some of the advantages you see there in terms of what are the advantages of having integrated accessibility uh, uh, regulations uh, as opposed to single fragmented um, uh, um, regulations? Thank you so much. Okay, how, while the panel gets preparing uh, an answer, uh, any other question you would like to put? Yes, the gentleman in the fourth row. Yes, hello. It's Ahmed from Gates, actually. Uh, and uh, my question to my colleague, uh, Tracy, there. Uh, I like the idea, but I would like to, if, if you can um, consider a local kind of certification, like, for example, uh, a certification based on the UAE uh, standards we, we just developed with Dubai uh, municipality or in Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, what, what do you think if there is, in, in, uh, I, I mean in the future, if there is any kind of, 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 of futuristic plans for such so, certifications? Um, great question. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so um, we will pass now to answer the questions. Still to have time to grab a sandwich. Yeah. There is another one there? Yes. On the back of the room? Okay, last question on the back of the room. Thank you very much. I'm Annie Carrillo. I have a web accessibility company in Mexico, Hear Colors, and I was very interested in the web accessibility certificate from Austria. Uh, we're trying to push forward a similar model in Mexico, and I saw in your presentation that it said that it didn't have commercial purposes, so I was wondering if the certificate has any cost, and if not, how is this uh, project funded? Thank you. Okay, so Klaus, I think you have an uh, interesting cha challenge to say what's the difference between legislation and standards, what level, how do you strike the balance, and then uh, to tell us about your certificates, how you finance and the commercial purpose. I will keep it kiss. Yeah. Short and simple, okay. Uh, yes, the relation between the laws and the standards, uh, it's quite simple here in Austria, for example. Uh, the law refers to an international standard, and the international standard is the ISO 4500, the WCAG 2.0, uh, in the future 2.1, uh, and there to the uh, AA. What in, in other countries, I can't I can't say about I uh, can't say nothing about this. Yeah, but we are referring to um, to the WCAG 2.0 A, and in the WCAG uh, you have the techniques. So uh, you can you can see how to program uh, a website and how it has to be fulfilled on the technical side. Yeah, so that's that's quite simple. And we are referring to to Austrian laws. Yeah, and I think uh, in the in the future there will be uh, there will this will be on the European level because of the uh, Web Accessibility Directive and also about the EN 301549, which was mentioned before. Uh, uh, they are also referring uh, in the field of Web, web Accessibility to the WCAG. Uh, so that's. For, for, 
from my point of view, it's, it's very, it's very, it's very simple way. Uh, we're simple, simple and straightforward. And about the costs, yeah, uh, we don't have any commercial interests, but we have to pay the auditors, the auditors, and we have to pay all the, the reviews, and we have to pay uh, some other costs, some overhead costs, for example, for the infrastructure, for for the servers, and so on. Yeah, so that uh, um, the certificate costs. It depends on the level that we have. Uh, and the amount of uh, of sites in within the site uh, that uh, within the site that we that we have to improve, yeah, uh, that we have to prove or that we have to check, yeah. Uh, and how is it financed? We have a big player uh, uh, from out of the private sector now that has given us the money that we can implement it now. Uh, but I can bring it together with the responsible person in the Austrian Computer Society who is in charge of that. And so you can discuss with him all the details. Perhaps you can uh, copy paste our model to Mexico. Uh, that would be a good opportunity. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here, <laughs> frankly spoken. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I think that the, the issue of the relation between the standards and legislation is really um, uh, very, um, very crucial for getting it, getting it right. There is, a, there is a natural tension between, uh, you know, having general legislation that will last for long and having detailed technical requirements that say how to implement or make it easy to check. And that tension is, is, is there, and you need to, to try to find, I mean, I think it's, Klaus gave us a very nice uh, uh, example of how to strike that balance between being precise and enforceable and being future-proof and, and, and looking to, to a flexible, uh, flexible scheme. But um, the tension is there, and uh, luckily we have some examples and solutions um, around, but um, you will need to really uh, work. I, I, I really also suggest that you talk to countries that have really legislation on accessibility for the long time, like um, the US Access Board and so forth, which can really give you some good examples of what is happening. Me, Sorry. You yes, of course, you can compliment. Thank you. Our experience in Paraguay was that uh, we first we work with the authorities to create the standards, the national regulations, technical ones that are being changed like every year because they are improving and they are entering new ones. So all those technical regulations are in a package of norms. And then we have the law that says that is mandatory for the public and private sector to accomplish that package but doesn't copy the package, because the, cop the package can be improved every year, not the law. So it's mandatory by the law, but the cap package is technically moving every day. Thank you very much for that additional uh, clarification. Now we go to Canada, and we have two questions in Canada. Should we start? Uh, by Gates, going to the very specific questions, and then we will go to the more general one about the different types of standards. Sure. So to the gentleman in the second row, I'm not sure I quite understood your question, but I think it's about the difference between the federal legislation and then some of the provinces have then broken off and created their own. So similar to the states, the provinces in Canada are self-regulate. Um, so there is that option for provinces to either follow the federal legislation or to uh, develop their own unique, um, similar but unique for their situation. Uh, I, I, I was actually filing, no, I'm sorry, I was actually on the province, like the Ontario Accessibility of Ontario with Disabilities yes. Act. Yes. Um, they started with the customer uh, the accessibility standards for customer services and goods, and then they, let alone they uh, kind of repealed them and then adopted the integrated accessibility standards mm -hmm. as regards to operationalization of the on yeah. accessibility of entire with disabilities. I think it might be. I think mm -hmm. it might be similar to the point that the uh, my colleague made from Paraguay that. It's, it's ongoing development, and as you know, time goes on and we learn more and have more input, 
it, it develops naturally. I, I hope that answers your question. And to the other point then about the, our certification program. So our certification program, and maybe I should have gone into a bit more detail on the, the mechanics of it, but it's broken into three levels of certification. So in the first level is for someone who is, is, um, has some experience, but really focuses regionally. So we do look at their knowledge at a regional level to begin with, and then um, as they work up in experience and knowledge, um, we expect level two and level three certification or uh, practitioners to have the, the ISO knowledge or the international um, uh, standards in their, in their toolkit as well. So we do try to um, not limit people by either their region or their education or their ability, um, but make it so that uh, a wide, diverse group of people can apply and be successful in this, in this certification based on the evaluation by the expert panel. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. And there is a participant uh, here from the Ontario um, uh, government. I think she's at the back of the room. If you, go, if you turn yourself, you will see she's raised, just raised her hand. So you, she would be able to explain the, um, in detail what's, all, all the exciting changes that are happening in, in, in Ontario while developing all the standards. Maybe if you would like to say one word about it, uh, then we can break for, for lunch. Thank you very much. My name is Mary Bartolomucci and I'm with the Accessibility Directorate in Ontario. Um, I, I will come and see you and I can tell you a little bit more about your question. Um, but yes, we do have the AODA. It's been in place since 2005. And we have the IASR, which is the integrated regulation. So we call it a regulation and we call it standards. We kind of use the same words, um, but it really is law. And those regulations are in place for both the public sector and the not-for-profit not sector and for the private sector. So um, I'm happy to answer your questions when you have a few minutes. Thank you very much. I think that the last intervention pointed out to a very important issue. Standards in across the world have got different implications. In the US, in Canada, they tend to, to have mandatory, to be mandatory rules. In Europe, they tend to be voluntary documents that supplement legislation. So that would need to be uh, clarified. In any case, uh, there is no more time for questions. I would love to, to continue engaging with you. I'm sure that the next panel is already waiting. We started late, uh, but we have to finish on time. So thank you very much to the excellent panel that uh, we have had uh, today, uh, the privilege to have them sharing their experience and knowledge. And thanks to all of you for having listening and all the questions that you have put. And they remain around in the conference. So as uh, they say in the CERO conference, continue to networking and get contacts with uh, direct contact with the experts uh, if you have uh, more questions uh, to ask or more experiences to share. Thank you very much and see you around.